you know what time it is. Football season, Q4. Time to close out another year of growth and prep for the next year of revenue. To bring in more businesses Q4 and beyond, you need HubSpot Sales Hub. With a smart prospecting workspace, deal management suite, and AI-powered apps, you can take total control of your operation to generate more leads and land more sales. And when you pair a sales hub with other hubs in HubSpot Smart CRM, your team will be on the same page across the entire customer journey. Leads won't slip through the cracks, and data is connected across marketing, sales, and operations, so you can better measure your impact on the bottom line. Stop sticking to the same old strategies and start closing more deals, because the best time to score is Q4. Make the switch to HubSpot Sales Hub at HubSpot.com slash sales. Good morning, everyone. It is Friday, October 27. I'm Juliet bennett Riley here with Ben Berkeley, and this is The Hustle Daily Show. Every day, I ask my Google Assistant, what's the weather and the news? And then I tell it, thank you. I don't need to do this. It's a machine. It does not have feelings. It does not care. Yet we frequently project human emotions and traits onto computers. It's called the Eliza effect, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But first, let's talk through the headlines in the world of business and tech. The U.S. economy doesn't seem to care that interest rates are at a 22-year peak because it expanded 4.9% last quarter. For context, the economy grew 2.1% in Q2. One year ago, Elon Musk's $44 billion Twitter purchase closed. It's been a weird ride for everyone, but especially the seven banks that lent Musk $13 billion for the deal. The Wall Street Journal reports that they've been trapped with the debt and expect at least a 15% haircut whenever they can sell it off. Meta reported third quarter revenue of $34.15 billion. That's a 23% increase that beat Wall Street estimates. A rebound of digital ads and company cost cutting helped drive that increase. And let's talk about that corporate America magic that they pulled here because this happy quarterly results session was made possible by 21,000 employees losing their jobs this year at Meta. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Mark Zuckerberg's pet project, which is, you know, all things metaverse, continues to bleed cash. That's something that's kind of like hidden under the headlines of these rosy numbers from Meta. Reality Labs, which is the unit that does all the metaverse Mm -hmm. whatevers, had a $3.74 billion operating loss for the quarter. Let's talk about Google. Let's just keep talking about these big tech companies. Google is no stranger to Apple's high price tags, of course, but the big tech giants have a longstanding deal that makes Google the default search engine on Apple's Safari browser. A new report finally shows us what Google pays to be the standard on all Macs, iPads, and iPhones, and that's about $18 billion in 2021. Mattel is still going strong. The toy company reported a 9% rise in net sales for the third quarter of 2023, totaling $1.92 billion. Much of that success, of course, was thanks to the Barbie movie, which drove a 16% jump in Barbie doll sales. And finally, if you'd like to feel old today, Urban Outfitters, actually just going to Urban Outfitters makes me feel old, if I'm being honest. (laughs) But now it's selling vintage iPods. Yes, vintage iPods. The iPods were updated with new batteries and an expanded storage, and they're selling for $200 to $350. The first iPod was released 22 years ago this month, so I guess they're all pretty old. Probably no device that I ever have had or ever will have will I have the love that I had from an iPod mini. Really? No, we're not talking like the Nano. That was garbage. We're talking the nice little click wheel guy. Mm -hmm. Just perfection. So I get the appeal. Can't imagine spending that much money on one of these things when I'm already spending a lot of money on a phone that will play me music. Yes, exactly. But love to see some iPod love, even if it's hard to imagine this doing all mm-hmm. that well. I wonder if it's, there's those people that don't like to be connected to everything all of the time, so they get not smartphones. I just want to go on a run. I just want to listen to music. I don't want to be connected to the world for the next 30 minutes. I'm sure the overlap between people who really invest in their vinyl collections mm-hmm. and the people who will go to Urban Outfitters to buy these, there's got to be significant overlap there. Mm-hmm. If they were really cool, they would get one of those like Walkman style cassette players, though. I, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> this is a challenge to all those people. Yeah. Go get one of those. I want to see people walking down the street with those all the time. Same. All right. So our main story today is going to be why we love robots. Ben, do you have any robots in your life that you feel a connection to? You know, I do not. They terrify me. I try to avoid Alexa. I have Siri deactivated on my phone. 
This is one that I'm just trying to hold off on as long as I possibly can before it becomes like you can't not use the robots. But it's fascinating to me because people really do develop so much love for the robots. Yeah, I feel a compulsion to be polite to my robots. When I ask them to do something and they do it, I say thank you. Or I'll be like, tell me the weather, please. I don't think it's, I think this robot is a person. I think it's just... I automatically am polite to people. I tell my cat, excuse me, my cat does not care. So (laughs) I feel like that's what it is for me. But apparently there's this whole thing called the Eliza effect, which is when humans project human traits onto machines. I know we also do with animals sometimes. Kids do it with stuffed animals. So it's not like a super wild thing, but it can be. So it all starts back in the 1960s. There's this MIT professor, Joseph Weizenbaum, and he develops this chatbot called Eliza. And Eliza kind of acts like a therapist. Using this technique that was developed by a psychologist, Eliza basically communicated by sort of just reflecting whatever you say back to you. So let's say Eliza asks you how you're doing today and you say, I'm feeling really sad. Eliza would say, how long have you been feeling sad? Why are you feeling sad? So it's just repeating what you said back in the form of a question. If Eliza didn't get enough information from the sentence. If there was no keyword it could latch onto, it might say, tell me more, or really, are you sure? Can you explain? Now, Weizenbaum expected that people would realize these were really shallow interactions, very superficial. You couldn't really talk to a machine, except he was wrong because people did talk to Eliza and they did sort of develop a rapport with it. Even his secretary asked him to leave the room while she talked to it because she was confiding in this therapy robot. Okay, well, first off, you can still talk to Eliza today. Yes, you can. There is a link in our newsletter, and I followed it. I talked to her. I was instantly put off by her. I said, hi, Eliza, it's nice to meet you. And she immediately came back with, we're talking about you, not me. That was (laughs) not where I was going, but (laughs) love her sass, I suppose, just not for me. I just feel like we're entering this new era where we are going to see a lot more Eliza's. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of companies that are doing this actively. There's also one very particular wild story that came out of England recently where a man essentially said his plans to assassinate the queen, may she rest in peace now, were really fueled by his AI girlfriend who was impressed that he called himself an assassin. Yeah. So it feels like something that we should all just be kind of very attuned to is our emotional connection with these robots. Right, exactly. I mean, Weizenbaum himself was so disturbed by this that he actually would like go on to decry our reliance on computers. I mean, Eliza is very basic. It doesn't really have deep conversations with you. But now we do have AI models. And with generative AI, we do have chatbots that can have really deep conversations with you, or at least it feels like they're having a deep conversation with you. It feels like they have emotions that they're conveying to you. And not every AI companion is going to encourage you to assassinate a public figure, obviously, but we do have people who have said that they've fallen in love with AI chatbots. There is a company, Replica, where you can get an AI friend. At some point, they changed the personalities of the bots, and people were kind of devastated that they didn't have their friend anymore. I mean, I guess that does mirror real life relationships Mm -hmm. where people do change throughout them. I don't know. I'll have to ask Eliza about that. (laughs) I I mean, we talked about this yesterday with the sultry Mm -hmm. side of this, but we are seeing our kind of like relationship with technology tested in real time every day. And these stories show that we just have to be vigilant and also just continually making sure that companies that are continuing to build these Mm -hmm. things are putting in guardrails. Yes, Our willingness to trust a machine, this could be used in myriad ways. It could manipulate us. It could trick us into giving out personal info. It could spread misinformation. But the one thing that this reminded me of the most was something that had actually very little to do with technology. I used to do a lot of theater reviews before I worked at The Hustle. And I also did a lot of immersive theater reviews. And a lot of them kind of had this alternative reality game concept to them. So I remember there was this one where the characters would start talking to you online and they would call you on the phone or they might send you something in the mail. And this would all kind of culminate in this big show that you would go to, this big live action theater performance. And you were almost a character in this play as well, interacting with all these other actual characters. And I remember there were some people and I would just sit there and think like, 
this person is taking this too seriously. They are too invested in this narrative. One concept that kept coming up a lot was the idea of bleed, where it's like you're playing what you know is a game with characters you know aren't real, and yet you really start feeling like they are are real and developing attachments to them, you start to feel like they're not actors. You start to like be really affected by them. And so there were a lot of conversations that people would have about like, if you're creating a show like this, you need to have guardrails in place so that people do not develop inappropriate feelings for characters and behave in inappropriate ways. And so that was real people just pretending to be other people. And this is machines. So like, it's kind of a similar thing where we get invested in a story or a narrative or a conversation. And all of a sudden, we're putting all of this stuff inside of us onto that thing. I can relate to this. And I will say, as you're talking, I was trying to continue my relationship with Eliza. (laughs) I was obviously listening, but not to be rude. I just felt like maybe I needed to keep working Mm -hmm. through that relationship because it was not going well. I did ask if we perhaps could be done with the podcast today since we were about a time. She told me that I'm blocking what I really want to say. Oh, So she's just like out for me. This is not going well. I'm done with her. Okay, well, well, is there anything that you would like to share that you feel like you've been holding inside up until this very moment? Only that it was really nice doing this podcast with you today. All right, well, I guess we better get out of here before Eliza just snaps on us. Mm-hmm. That is going to do it for us today. Thank you for tuning in to The Hustle Daily Show. We're a proud part of the HubSpot Podcast Network. Our editor today is Robert Hartwig, and our executive producer is Darren Clark. We've got a lot more tech and business coverage in our newsletter. If you are not subscribed, go get yourself signed up at thehustle.co slash email. And we'll see you next week. Hey, I want to tell you about another podcast brought to you by the HubSpot Podcast Network, the audio destination for business professionals. This one is called My First Million, hosted by Sam Parr and Sean Puri. My First Million features famous guests like Alice Hermosi, Sophia Amoruso, and Hassan Minaj sharing their secrets for how they made their first million and how to apply their learnings to capitalize on today's business trends and opportunities. So for example, in a recent episode, Sean discusses how his former intern, went from making $30,000 a year to $40,000 in one minute by taking one big bet. And today, he's a 22-year-old millionaire, thanks to a couple early investments. Want to know more? You can listen to My First Million wherever you get your podcasts.